Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1119 of the Juicebox Podcast. Well, the new Cold Wind series is four weeks old now, and I thought it would be interesting for those of you who are enjoying it to know where I got the idea. The Cold Wind series came from my experience recording the episode you're about to hear. This episode features an anonymous female. She's a nurse practitioner who works in an endocrinologist office, and she has type 1 diabetes. I think this episode may be two years old. Well, the recording is. You've never heard it before. At the end of the episode, you'll hear me say, I don't think we should put this out. I'm afraid you would lose your job. And it was in that moment that I thought, I wish I had a way to mask her voice. But back then, I didn't. I held on to the recording because I really did wish I could put it out, and I thought maybe one day we'll be able to change people's voices. And of course, now we can, and we're using that technology in the Cold Wind series. So, you want to hear this anonymous guest talk about where she works and tell her story? Buckle in, because we're going to get going in just a moment. Please don't forget that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Dexcom G7, made for all types of diabetes. Dexcom G7 can be used to manage type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes. You're going to see the speed, direction, and number of your blood sugar right on your receiver or smartphone device. Dexcom dot com slash juice box. This episode of the juice box podcast is sponsored by touched by type one touched by type one dot org and find them on Facebook and Instagram touched by type one is an organization dedicated to helping people living with type one diabetes and they have so many different programs that are doing just that check them out at touched by type one dot org. Hello and welcome to the Cold Wind series from the Juice Box Podcast. These episodes will feature physicians, nurses, and other professionals who agreed to come on the show anonymously to share what they see in the healthcare profession. I've altered the voices of each guest so that they can remain anonymous and feel comfortable telling us what really goes on at their job. Just listen to how well the voice altering works. My name is Beth, and my oldest child has type 1 diabetes diagnosed in October 2020. My name is Beth, and my oldest child has type 1 diabetes diagnosed in October 2020. If you work in healthcare and have a chilling story to tell about your experiences in the healthcare field, contact me today. I'll get you right on the show. Your story does not need to be specific to diabetes. I'm going to find out a little bit about you. How old were you when you were diagnosed? I was 17. Hmm. That's only four short years ago. Yeah. No, it, it feels like an eternity, but it's really been like nothing. So, Really? It does feel like a long time? It kind of does. Because the past few years is like when you're like actually becoming a human. Like the rest of it is like growing up. And I mean, that's obviously part of real life. But like the part where you're like you're autonomous and like making decisions, like my adult formative years. I've had type one, so it kind of just feels like it's what I do. Yeah. So you kind of don't think of yourself prior to that adulty starting time. Yeah. Makes sense. Were you graduated from high school when you got it or not quite? Um, so that's a whole weird story in itself. I graduated from high school in a different country when I was 15. Okay, slow down. Um, <laughs> hold on. Jeez, geez, just okay, hold on. How, why, where? Um, uh, so I uh, I got a scholarship to study abroad. It was My mom was like, you can never study abroad. And I was like, what if I get a scholarship? And she's like, that'll never happen. It ended up happening. I went abroad and the school system's kind of different. So I was able to like use the credits I had and I graduated high school there. And then I, after that year, I came back to the US, re-enrolled in an American high school and kind of did like my last two years again. So it was like weird, but it worked out. What made you want to study abroad? Like when you're 14 or 15 years old, what makes you think I want to go to another country to finish high school? I kind of just wanted to see something else because it was like 
things here get like monotonous. Mm -hmm. It feels like the same thing every day. Like I love it, but it's very much the same all the time. And I was like, I kind of want to see what's out there. So seriously, yeah, no, it was a, it was a really neat opportunity. How long does it take you to get acclimated? I kind of felt okay after about three, four months. Wow. And how long were you there in total? I was there a year. Wow. And the credits piled up differently. So, so you were graduated when you were 16 still? Yeah. So I graduated and then I moved back to the U.S. Were you planning on going to college early or were you going to like mess around? So I didn't want to go to college early. So I went to EMT school and then I finished EMT school and I was like, this is cool, but I want to do more. So I went to paramedic school. And then once I finished that, I went to college. Wow. So all those different experiences led you to believe you wanted to go to college or were you just finally willing to separate? Yeah. So I got back and it was like, it was being away was like that, like exhilarating thrill of like, this is something it's all new. And then I knew that college was going to be like more mundane than that per se, Mm -hmm. which sounds bad. Well, I don't know that when you're away by yourself, do you end up having more adult experiences than you would have at that age? Or is it not like that? Completely. Like I never imagined that as a 15 year old, I'd be like lost in a train station in the middle of nowhere and like have to find my way back. Like absolutely horrifying in the moment, but it kind of gives you that like feeling like I can do this. I'm okay. Right. You you feel like that because nobody jumped you. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Probably like I would have been accosted from behind. That would be right. If you're like, no, somebody beat me (laughs) senseless and took my wallet from me, then you'd be like, you know, I've learned I really don't want to be by myself at a train station. It's interesting how your uh, experience shapes the rest of it. (laughs) 100%. All right, cool. So you went, you got your high school diploma, you came home, you're like, hey, this is great. And then you got diabetes. Yeah. Yay. (laughs) 100% total party. Uh, Anybody else in the family have type one or other autoimmune issues? No, but no type one, but autoimmune, like my mom has a host of autoimmune things. My grandma, my great grandma, um, my dad, like it's, it's there for sure. Really? Can you give me a quick fire cell list? Yeah. So my mom has hypothyroid. She has rheumatoid arthritis and she has lupus. Wow. And then my dad has rheumatoid arthritis. That is a trifecta for your mom. So yeah. Jeez. Yep. Do you have any of those? I do not. Knock on wood. Let's keep it that way. <laughs> yeah. I could, we could beat on some wood, actually, if I, I might tip my yeah, desk. My, my desk is wood. I'll get you. Do you feel worried that there might be coming? I mean, I've never really kind of like put it in the forefront of my brain. So I hope it doesn't happen. But I don't like sit and like sit in my bedroom at night and like lose sleep over it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, tell me a little bit about the experience of, I mean, were you like a paramedic and EMT while you had type one? So it's actually kind of funny because you just put out an episode with, I believe her name was Sarah Mm -hmm. and she was talking about how she was like diagnosed in EMT school. Yeah. So in the paramedic program I was in, it was like an expectation that the paramedic students would help teach the EMT class Mm -hmm. and EMTs couldn't check blood glucose values until like 2017, which is wild to think that like you think someone's showing up to your house to save you and they can't even check your blood sugar. Mm. But so we were teaching the EMT students how to check blood sugars and we were using like the paramedic students as like dummies. And I was like, oh, you guys can check my blood sugar. And the meter just read high. And I was like, haha, that's funny. It's broken. Dexcom G7 offers an easier way to manage diabetes without finger sticks. It is a simple CGM system that delivers real time glucose numbers to your smartphone, your smartwatch, and it effortlessly allows you to see your glucose levels and where they're headed. My daughter is wearing a Dexcom G7 right now, and I can't recommend it enough. Whether you have commercial insurance, Medicare coverage, or no CGM coverage at all, Dexcom can help you. Go to my link, Dexcom.com slash juicebox, and look for that button that says get a free benefits check. That'll get you going with Dexcom. When you're there, check out the Dexcom Clarity app or the follow. Did you know that people can follow your Dexcom? Up to 10 people can follow you. Uh, Right now, I'm following my daughter, but my wife is also following her. Her roommates at school are following her. So I guess Arden's being followed right now by five people who are concerned for her health and welfare. And you can do the same thing. School nurses, your neighbor, people in your family, everyone can have access to that information if you want them to have it. Or if you're an adult and you don't want anyone to know, you don't have to share with anybody. It's completely up to you. 
Dexcom.com slash juicebox. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com. And when you use my link to learn about Dexcom, you're supporting the podcast. The podcast is sponsored today by Touched by Type 1. Head now to touchedbytype1.org. Click on that Programs tab at the top to learn all about what Touched by Type 1 is doing for people living with diabetes. The annual conference, awareness campaign, Bowl for a Cause, their dance program, Dancing for Diabetes, their D-Box, the golf outing, and so much more. Touchedbytype1.org. And then another group did it on a different meter, and I was like, oh, all these meters must just be broken. But in my brain, I was like, this is not good. Um, I have to ask a question that has nothing to do with this. Yeah, go ahead. When you heard Sarah tell that story, were you like, son of a, that's my story. And I'm not lying. I was on the highway and I pulled over. <laughs> I was like, I'm not hearing this right now. I was like, this is insane. Like, I didn't think that this could ever happen to anybody else. Well, and not only that, but she stole it from you telling it on the podcast, too. Yeah, I know. I was like, I was like, hey, I think I have this like story. It's like kind of wild. And then it was like, actually not that wild. Happened to a girl named Sarah as well. I Great. know. <laughs> That's amazing. I, yeah. I have to tell you, I, I had to Google Arden's name today. Mm-hmm. And because we were talking about on, I just recorded with her and I was talking with her and we were talking about how at one point I was aware of another person with her first and last name who also had type one diabetes. That's wild. And that just seems crazy because I don't have a completely yeah. common last name and Arden's first name is, is fairly uncommon. And yeah, I know it's not like a Josh, like a John Smith or something like it that. It's like pretty unique. Yeah, so I Googled it, and then I found there are two other people with that name living within, like, like one of them is in Harrisburg, and one of them went to school in Philadelphia, and I was like, but we're not related. That's kind of wild. Yeah, I thought, oh, that's odd. Anyway, I'm, I'm thinking the same thing about your story, but it is interesting. Like, you were like, I have an incredibly unique diagnosis story. And, and then it's just like, not. <laughs> and then a podcast you're listening to, some girl comes on and tells your diagnosis story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, am I hearing this right now? Is, like, is this real? Yeah, yeah it's really. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really amazing. Okay, so you find out and do you get a free ride in an ambulance when that happens or what do you do? No, so I went to my pediatrician and the whole thing kind of manifested weirdly. My, like my blood sugars, it was just strange. It wasn't like a classic diagnosis situation because I had like really wild highs where I'd be like 500s and then I'd have days where it was like, okay. Hmm. So I was actually started on like metformin, which is strange because I'm a very small person. Started on metformin, then on Danuvia. That didn't really work. And then we kind of just, and then it was like, okay, this is type one. And I started on insulin. So how long was that process of going through the medication? A while. Like a, a long while. Yeah. A year? It was probably, yeah, it was actually honestly like a year. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So now you're 18. Yeah, was, mm-hmm. You've done everything, right? You've lived away. You have your diploma. You've decided no college. But at some point, when does the experience of being a paramedic and EMT and make you feel like I'm going to do something else? So that summer, I did end up going to college. And I like worked as a paramedic through college, which was, I, I didn't love school. I mean, for me, it was just weird. Like I, my interests, I'm like the world's most boring person. I don't drink. I don't go out. I'm just like boring. I know that sounds bad, but like, I don't really do anything. So for that piece, I didn't love college, but I, I loved like working as a paramedic through college and like showing, this sounds, sounds so bad, like showing up for the drunk people. Like that sounds so bad, but I don't know. It was just weird. Wait a minute. But. <laughs> First of all, I don't think it's boring if you don't like doing stuff like that. I think that's fine. Yeah, it was it was an interesting experience. Yeah. So. Also, the school you went to and not drinking, that's fairly uncommon. Oh, trust me, I know. Yeah. I know. It was <laughs> and like I don't think there's anything wrong with drinking. I just think it like smells really bad. <laughs> so I sound like an idiot saying this. I don't mind how you feel about it. I'm just saying that to get through that particular college without drinking is a bit of its own yeah. accomplishment, honestly. I like, I didn't live on campus. I lived in the firehouse. So I was like slightly removed from it all, but wait, yeah. Wait, you lived, were you a paid, a paid person? At the so fire- I was paid for a local hospital. I was a paid medic for a local hospital. And then I was a volunteer in the firehouse. And you got to live there? Yeah. For four that years? That's kind of like the deal. 
Really? I, yeah, I did college in three years. So, I mean, I didn't like freeload from them for four, but still. So That's pretty cool. And you also got, you got to save on your, on your room and board, too. Yeah, 100%, which, I mean, and it was a great group of people. They were hilarious. Yeah. So, I enjoyed it. That's really excellent. Good for you. That is, that's an interesting and different story. See, finally. See, Sarah, you didn't do that, <laughs> did you? Ha. Huh? But there will be someone after me who will have the same thing. So. I, I'm now thinking Sarah's going to write me an email and be like, I lived in a firehouse in college. <laughs> I know. Sarah, we should just share stories. <laughs> if that happens, you guys should totally meet each other. Um, 100%. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Very cool. I want to understand now. So you have type one. Mm-hmm. So why did you reach out to me originally? Were you having trouble? No. So I honestly just reached out completely in gratitude because I don't know how I would have been able to do like working as a paramedic running. Cause I mean, I run distance. So I was like running long distances, like just kind of like, because of the things I learned on the podcast, I didn't have to lose who I was, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. I feel like if I didn't have what I learned on the podcast, I wouldn't have gotten to be myself. Oh. And that meant a lot to me. Oh, I'm glad that that's really, that's lovely to hear. Are you still in college? No, I graduated. In three years, you said. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't, okay. But you would be if you didn't graduate in three years, is that right? Yeah, I would. And what, what was your major in? So I majored in biology. I thought I wanted to go to med school. And then I decided, I mean, I did the whole, the whole stupid nine yards. I took the MCAT. I did all that jazz. I got into med school and then I was like, you know what? I want to be a nurse practitioner instead. So I'm in school for that now. Wait, you got in, you got accepted to a, a school? Yeah. Will you say which like, one? Eh. I mean, will I could. You, will you tell me and I'll bleep it out if you don't want it in here? Sure. Okay, go ahead. So I got accepted into... You got accepted into four different medical schools. Yeah, please bleep that out. <laughs> I don't want people to know. Because okay? you're why? Because you're calling your your sister a badass, and you're one. Is that why? I don't know. I just I don't know. I don't. It worry. feels weird. I don't know. You feel like you're bragging. Kind of. How many did you apply to? I applied to ten. That's an astonishing ratio. Thank you. Good for. Are you super smart? I like school, but at the end of the day, like, I don't know, it, it makes, I just want to be a good person. That's my only objective. And I just feel like silly. I don't know. I listen, my wife got out of college and wanted to go to medical school, but we couldn't even afford the applications. It's wicked expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were on our own and really young. Mm-hmm. And so we just picked one and sent one off. It was a complete, like, there was no way it was going to happen like that. But her MCATs were good. Her grades were good. She that's went awesome. to a, a university that's respected for its sciences and she's mm-hmm. Kelly's super like smart and studious. She loves to go to school and learn and everything. And awesome. uh, it was, it was, you know, we never got back to it because we just, you know, the process is just like ridiculous. Isn't the word. And I don't mean it to sound like condescending, but it's just like, it just feels so, so like inhuman. I don't know. Well, it, it, they are definitely making it as difficult as humanly possible like they're trying yeah. to weed people out and even maybe i understand that a little bit but back then like kelly could have used a little grace like she was in a in a bad spot and would have been mm-hmm. nice if we could have applied to a couple places i always wonder how she would have made out i think well i actually think kelly would be a good doctor but you know you make babies and start making money and you're like well and then life happens and yeah. then it's like priorities are different and yeah yeah you gotta keep doing this right mm-hmm. okay so you don't feel like you just like, let's go backwards for a second. You just want to be a good person. Yeah. That's kind of my big goal. Have you not accomplished that goal yet? I mean, I hope I have, but I don't know if I'm the person to be the judge of that. So are you like shy? Um, I'm, I'm not shy. I'm kind of like an, an introverted. I'm like an extroverted introvert, if that makes sense. It doesn't, but you tell me more about it. I will understand it better. You're an extroverted introvert. So the process of dealing with people is tiring, but you enjoy the idea. Like, I love talking to people. I love making connections with people. I find it so neat to like hear people's story and like find ways to help people and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, like I do kind of just like come home. I go for my run. I decompress. I train and like. And that's that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's lovely. 
you living with your parents or are you on your own? I am. It makes me feel kind of like I'm not a real adult, but I'm, I moved back home a little bit ago. So are you still volunteering or working at the uh, fire department? So I, since I moved out of that area, I'm not running right now with them and I miss it a ton. I go up every once in a while just to run a, run a few calls because I do miss it. Yeah. But I'm, I'm working now at like an endo office and I love that. So. Okay. I want to hear about that in a second. I volunteered for three years and, uh, as a fireman and I was there one day visiting and there was a fire and somebody else, your gear's still here. And I was like, okay. I was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I was like, all right. So I put it on and, and I went and it's like riding over, trying to remember all the things that I needed to do. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh my gosh. That's awesome. like praying nothing was really on fire. I was like, let this just be like something simple. <laughs> so I can just, yeah, 95% of the time there's like no real fire, but yeah. yeah. Now anyway. Yep. That's fun though. So you, you just went out in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming we're like, got the first job you applied for, right? Yeah. So I like had no idea what I was doing. My first job interview, I biked down a highway in the pouring down rain and then like dried my clothes on a hand dryer in the basement of the hospital. (laughs) And I like somehow got the job. I'm convinced it's because they were desperate, but it worked out. (laughs) Can you believe she showed up on a bike? (laughs) I didn't have a car and I like had to get, it was, oh, it was was something. Did you tell them that? Did you say I biked here? No, well, no, like I like I got there and I was like, I don't know where to do. I'm soaking wet. I look like I just walked out of the shower. So I'm like stumbling around in this hospital. I find this bathroom. I like, because I, I show up ridiculously early to things. It's just how I am. Mm-hmm. And I had enough time to like make myself look presentable. I like walk into this room with a bunch of like men who were like 20 years older than me and it worked out, but like, I was terrified. <laughs> I'm sure they saw something in you. I don't know, but it worked out. So well, good for you. And it's not, it's a hospital. Am I right? It's part of a hospital. Part yeah. Of the hospital. Okay. So you sent me a note one day, not so long ago, I feel like, and no, I, I, I was really touched by it. So, but you were, now I'm seeing, now that I'm speaking with you, the note makes more sense. Why did you reach out to me? Like, what was the, give me the whole genesis of that, of that, thought in your head because i don't think it started where it ended is that correct yeah no so i i got this job so my end goal is to be a diabetes nurse practitioner like that's kind of what i want to do it's not kind of that is what i want to do and so i'm working in this endo's office and i love it i love my job and i love patients and i love every bit of it what i really hate is the advice like i can't it, it drives me insane like I pulled up a, I was working on something yesterday and I pulled up a chart note yesterday that said patient is incorrectly treating hypoglycemia with one glucose tab. And I wanted to like rip my computer screen off of the monitor. Like it just, it's these little things that like people want to do well and they're trying to do well and they get this advice. Like, you know, this, everyone who's listening to this podcast knows this, like you get this advice that sets you up for failure Mm -hmm. and it drives me insane. And, um, and you're very passionate about it too. Yeah, no, like it, it, it really bugs me. Cause like I, I go home at night and I think about these people who want to do the right thing, but they, they're given advice that like, it's, it's like, this is supposed to be the person who's supposed to lead you down the right path. And I mean, like everyone, like I said, everyone who listens to podcasts knows that that's not what happens. And I, I think that's something I didn't even realize until I was working here is like, the group of people that hear things like this and the group of people who have access to things like this, it's, it's so much of a smaller group than we know. And we think like, I have not come across a single type two diabetic on insulin in our office who is not on a sliding scale. Like no one has a carb ratio of our type ones. I'd say that probably more than 50% are on a sliding scale. Okay. And like, you think like standard of care is going to be that carb ratio and people are not on that. And it drives me insane. (laughs) You're saying half the people you meet are on a sliding scale if they have type one. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And that makes you nuts. It drives me absolutely bonkers. Yeah. No, I love that about you. That's one of the things (laughs) I love about you. So, um, yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I, we need like motivated people like you to do things for masses of people who don't know they need it done for them. And I agree with you 
wholeheartedly. I mean, I'm very proud of how many people the podcast reaches. As a matter of fact, yesterday was Sunday, and Sunday is usually my lowest day of the week. That makes mm-hmm. sense. And yesterday was the most popular Sunday by triple. A, That's a, amazing. The best one ever. And I was even like, what's happening? I started asking quite, I went on Facebook and I put a poll up. I'm like, did a bunch of you just start listening to the show recently? Or like, I was trying to figure out what. I saw that. I saw that. I was like, and it made me super excited because I've been listening since, I mean, I've been listening since I was diagnosed. So I felt like super excited clicking like more than a year ago. I was like, I'm one of the OGs. You are. But yeah. Some people were like. I kind of felt like it. <laughs> one woman said, I started listening at episode four and I was like, wow, I, I have to be honest with you back then there were maybe maybe 1500 people listening and you know and i'd be surprised if there's not 1500 downloads while i'm talking to you (laughs) so that's that's just like that makes me so excited because if people would just hear this advice like they would be able to fly it and i know that sounds cheesy but like this is what people need and this is what people don't get well i'll tell you why i don't think it sounds cheesy because i got an email from jenny the other day let me see if i can find it so sometimes when jenny meets people who I don't get to meet and they talk about the podcast, she'll send me a note and say, Hey, I, I talked to you. She keeps it pretty generalized, you know, like, mm-hmm. like, you know, you sometimes talk about. Yeah. Good old like hippo. Right. Right. You just talk around it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, somebody who had had diabetes for, I want to think it was a, if I'm remembering right, a woman who'd had diabetes for a number of years and she found the podcast and got like out of the sevens, like she was just stuck in the sevens forever. And, That's awesome. and got out, got her A1C down into the lower sixes. And it, very awesome. crazy. And she said it was from the pro tip series. It, and like, it's so true. Like the, that, that is the core of it all. Like it's all right there. Yeah. And it's just, it's, I mean, look, I hate saying it like this because I know diabetes is really difficult, but there really are these kind of core tenants. And if you get mm-hmm. them even close A1C drops pretty quickly, you you know, like, like, it's so true. And like, I know it's, it's hard because like, there's the medical advice piece of it. And then there's the like real life piece of it. Mm -hmm. And like, so we, and I know it's possible for for providers to give that advice. So as an example, we have um, like a satellite. So we have our main office and then our one nurse practitioner who is like the most amazing human being ever. She, um, she has type one and she runs our like diabetes clinic at like the maternal fetal medicine okay. part of our like hospital. Mm-hmm. And I kid you not, all of those patients are in the fives, like all of them are in the fives or the low sixes. So it's possible. It's possible for a provider to get those results by yeah. giving the right advice. And I see it and I'm like, she, like, I just, I want to tell her, like, can you just see every patient? Because it's so possible. You get to see the results from different providers. Yeah. And so you, yep. you really, that's interesting. So, you know, when you look at a person, you can look them in the face and think, if you were just seeing a different doctor, your A1C would be lower. It's, it's the worst feeling ever. So I love data. Um, and I ran the numbers for our practice and I have all of, I, have, I ran all the numbers and I have A1C, average A1C by provider, average A1C by diabetes type, average A1C by if they're on a CGM or not, if they're on a pump or not. And the numbers, it's so clear. Like the biggest one is CGM makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Pump makes a huge difference. And provider, which is unfortunate, but it does. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a stark difference. Next time you mess with the numbers, do CGM users buy their high alarm? I would love to do that. It's just the only thing is with a thousand patients. I'd have to pull each one of their reports. Oh, that's a shame. Because I guarantee yeah. you that the lower their high alarm is, the more stable and lower their A1C. Yeah, problems. no, I 100% agree with that one. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. Mm-hmm. So when we're going back and forth one day, then you sort of just asked me like a big question, right? So what, what were you wondering? I guess the question was if we could get this to providers, this info. Right. And I said and- yes, and then you apologized. You're like, no, yeah, don't. That, that would be me. That's kind of what I do. <laughs> um, but so we we got off. One, you know, we went back and forth a couple of times and I could feel your excitement. Like you, I mm-hmm. could it, it felt like we were like standing at a doorway together. I was on one side, you were on the other. And you were like, I'm going to go find out right now. And you just ran away. And, you yeah. know, and, and then I didn't hear from you for a little while, which is reasonable. And my mm-hmm. wife's like, what are you doing? And I said, 
I said, there's a girl. And she goes, yep. okay. And I said, she works in a practice. And I think she would like it, me to come speak to the practitioners. And mm -hmm. I said, I don't know if that, so a lot of people say that not many of them get it worked out. Yeah. It becomes, there's a lot of hoops to jump through and mm -hmm. you start getting down to like, you've probably heard the um, episode with Kathleen, right? The endo. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you get down to like, you really start getting down to brass tacks and you're like, will, will 30 people sit in a room and listen to some guy who shows up and mm -hmm. says, if I was you, I would talk about it like this, you know, instead of the way you're doing it. Yeah. So I just thought like, I'll never hear from you again. Maybe other than for you to go, I'm so sorry, this didn't work out. But you sent me another note and you're like, hey, this might be working out for real. Like, are mm -hmm. you sure you want to do this? So can you tell me a little bit about what you did in the office to try to get it going? So I kind of forcefully convinced a few of our providers to listen to a, like, a, uh, it was like probably, it was the beginning of this year. Touched by Type 1 did that thing where you did like a really quick presentation for like an hour. Yeah. I recorded that okay, and I showed that to them and I, cause it kind of like, it, it kind of puts all of the pro tips into like one hour, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. And then I gave that to our managing physician and I gave it to our CDE and I talked to our practice manager and, they, and I was like, this guy, we need him, please. Wow. And they watched it. And so first of all, that hour talk, which I've never given the same way twice Mm -hmm. But in my mind, it's a primer to the podcast. Yeah. It should make you want to go listen to the pro tip series. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the best I've been able to figure out given a short amount of time. And keep in mind, usually I give that to people who are fairly newly diagnosed. And my goal is really just to make them believe that there's better, that better is obtainable and that they could take the steps that would be necessary. That really yeah. is, that's my whole goal with that. And then hopefully they go listen to the pro tip series. It makes sense. And then I, I think of it as like, then they can slowly implement it on their own time. If, it, mm -hmm. if, if it's something they're interested in. So you gave it to three people. Did, did you get any bad feedback? No, not at all. Excellent. Not at all. Like, and I think the thing that really, so the biggest thing that really cued me into the fact that this could be super helpful is like everything that has been effective for me and is effective for this entire like juice box podcast community is oftentimes the opposite of what's done in like an endo office. So if a patient calls in and says like, this happens all the time, a patient will call in and be like, I had a low blood sugar, a low blood sugar, mind you, like not like a pattern of lows, a singular low blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And there's certain providers that will hear that. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to point fingers, but like there's certain providers that will hear that and will completely change everything. For one low blood sugar. And mind you, they're considering a low blood sugar like an 86. Right. And they take away their basal, right? Exactly. And that's that's what I was going to say. They don't adjust the carb ratio. They cut out the basal. Yeah. And then they're on the roller coaster. And it's like, I was like, hey, just like listen to this. And it's like, more basal. Like, focus on the basal. Get the basal right. Because that, like, like you say, that's the foundation. And whenever someone has a low, the first thing that I feel people cut out is basal. And yeah. then people were on this horrible roller coaster of they can't get anything right. Right. Yeah. You. So for me, I look at the graph, and if if the balanced times, like away from food and mm -hmm. away from and away from meal time insulin or correction insulin, if those times are fairly steady, but higher, I think okay, the basal might not be high enough. There are people who look and then see the lows and right away think, oh no, the basal's too high; it's dragging you down. And, and it's that you're just overcorrecting for the lack of basil. But it's probably that you're overcorrecting. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes people's basil's way too high, yeah. and they do a – I almost cursed. I don't know why you made me <laughs> want to curse. They do a terrible job of bolusing their meals, or they don't pre-bolus at all. Mm -hmm. And so the high basil tries to fight with the meal – and, and it just can't win. And and it can't win, so you get higher, but then eventually the meal's gone and the the two high yep. basils left and it drops you back down again. But on a on a chart, on a graph, they almost look the same. Yeah. And I really don't know how to put into context that they aren't like when they look differently to me, but I can look at mm -hmm. them and most of the time think I know which one this is. And I do that by asking a very simple question of the person whose graph it is, which is do you find yourself more frequently feeding the insulin or do you find yourself mm -hmm. more frequently trying to impact a high with a correction? Yeah. 
if it's hot, and, you know, and that's your answer usually. Exactly. And like, I think the coolest thing for me, like working in those offices, I get to look at, like, I, I nerd out over this stuff, this stuff. I like, I get to look at like all sorts of graphs, graphs all day, every day. And mm-hmm. it's like, you see these things. And like the hardest part for me now is like, I'm in school. I'm not done with school but one day, but I sit there and I'm like, I just want to, I just want to say this. I just want to suggest this, but I have to shut my lips and let the provider. You don't allowed to call. say anything. Yeah. Yeah. And that like, I, I had a situation last week where a provider was honestly going to cut away like a, a ridiculous amount of a patient's basal rate for a compression well. And I said to them, I was like, this is a compression well. And they had no idea what that was. Mm. And it's like, it's, it's just things like that. So I'll yeah. get off my, I'll get off my rant now. I'm sorry. No, I love your rant. Your rant makes me excited. So you're <laughs> one of the people who like, and there's a lot of people who do this that are probably all going to hear this at the same time and laugh, but you're one of those people who like purposefully by mistake bumps into people in hallways, gets up to them and goes juice box podcast and then walks away from them. Kind of okay. like, so I, I get to do this kind of cool. The role I, I'm in right now is like an, an interesting mix of random things. But the, my favorite thing to do, and you can ask any of my coworkers, is they come to me when they have one of these. But um, starting a patient on a CGM, like that is my favorite thing in the world. Because I get like my like 20 minutes where it's just me in a room and I can impart on them like anything I want. And it's always like, this is not just a way to st- like not stick your finger. Like use this to not get high rather than to know when you're wildly high and listen to the juice box podcast. Oh, thank you. So I, I have to say, I get a lot more the, where do you, when people come into the private Facebook group, there's a couple of questions to answer. And one of them is like, where did you hear about the podcast? Mm-hmm. These two answers are becoming more and more frequent, which I'm super excited by. One of them is from my healthcare provider. And I'm always mm-hmm. like, yes, that's cool. And the other one that I really love is everywhere. That's, That's the one I love. Like, where did you hear about yeah. the Juice Box podcast? They're like everywhere. It's everywhere. I hear about it all the time. I'm like, ooh, good. like that just made me smile. And I know that sounds so stupid because it's it's your it's your project, but like, I just like this is how you succeed and have diet. Like, pe- my coworkers always like ask me. They're like, how is diabetes not? like your entire life because you work here and you have diabetes. And I was like, you don't understand. Like, I don't think about diabetes when I go home. I don't think about it because I know that I'm going to know if I'm under 65 and over 120, like I'm going to know because that's going to tell me and I'm going to fix it and I'm going to go on with my life. Um, but it's like, this is how diabetes doesn't run your life. Well, that's what the episode I put up today with Arden, you know, she, mm-hmm. she came on and I'm, there's no way you heard it yet. It's it literally just went up a few hours ago. But, I saw it was up. I was like, I need to watch this, but I was like running from from work. No, no, so. no, no. You, I, I'm just saying that I assume you haven't seen it, so or heard it. No, I heard haven't. It, excuse me. But she just says the same thing. She's like, I don't think about diabetes very often at all. Mm-hmm. Now, she doesn't think about it at all because I live here. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not because she knows all the nuances of it, but she's also 17 and she's had it for a really long time, so she's in a yeah. different scenario. But I like that feeling the feeling of she's like it'll be fine like i'm like well what if you get low at college she's like i'll be all right like it's it's yeah that vibe i'm sure it's gonna happen to her i'm sure i'm gonna get a note one day where it's like hey wow oh, oh last night did not go well you know but like mm-hmm. um she's on an algorithm i expect her to continue on with an algorithm i expect her to go to omnipod 5 mm-hmm. at some point so you know i don't think she's ever going to get like I mean, not that it couldn't happen, but I think generally speaking, she shouldn't have too many incredibly dangerous lows. She doesn't have them now. She does know what she's doing. My wife reminded me, my wife listened to the episode that Arden did, which by the way, she's so sarcastic and it's, it's interesting to listen to. My wife reminded me that we started to tell a story in that episode that we didn't finish. And the the finish to it was that my wife had gotten sick. She had gotten a, a kidney stone. And for the two days after she got back from the hospital, I wasn't around and only Arden was. And Arden exclusively took care of herself for 48 hours plus. And she was, I didn't know. I was somewhere else and remotely I could Mm -hmm. not tell on her CGM that that I wasn't there. And that's awesome. And like, she knows what she's doing. But if you ask her to explain it, she has no idea. Well, that's kind of like speaking English. Like, you know what you're doing, but you don't know how to explain it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just innate. Uh, So I guess that's like, that's a very good sign of just it being intuitive. I felt so too. And at the same time, when I said to her, what's the name of your insulin? And she's like, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> she told me 
she thought for a long time that it was Omnipod. <laughs> One day she heard me say it like Omnipod, and she thought I was mispronouncing the word. Uh, or I asked her no. what, what version of the G6, uh, what version of the Dexcom is she on? She had no idea. And when I asked her how to use her glucagon, she said, I don't remember. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, I, used, I love it. I used the brand name of it. And she's like, what, what is it? And I was like, the Givoke hypo pen. And she goes, what is, is that the thing in my purse? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, you know, you have glucagon, right? And she goes, oh yeah, yeah. She goes, I take it everywhere. And I was like, okay, there you go. And I have a trainer, like it's been on my desk forever. It's just a, mm-hmm. a plastic trainer pen. And I pulled it out and I was like, it's like this. Yep. Pop off the cap, you Stab it in. <laughs> push it on the skin, it clicks tw- once, it clicks twice, and you're all done. You remember me showing you this, right? And she goes, vaguely, or something like that. And I'm just like, <laughs> so yeah, so I think e- it would have been easy for some people to hear it and go, oh my God, see that? That girl, she doesn't know what she's doing, like her dad does the whole thing, but it's not true. Left on her own, she does really well. Yeah, and she knows what she's doing, and she's going to be just fine. Yeah. No, so we're going to do some more episodes where we're going to talk through like some of the, the mm-hmm. you know, the bare bones stuff that I think she'll need to know. Like things like if I was dying tomorrow, things I would sit down and tell her about her diabetes. Although I got to be honest with you, if I don't need a day left, I'd be like, listen, you should just go listen to some of those episodes. I, I have <laughs> very limited time. <laughs> but, You've got like all she's like you said, this is a recent episode, but like this is like kind of like the vault of like your connection with her. But like, honestly, though, it's like anyone can find this and be chill. And like, if we've all succeeded, like clearly Arden's going to be just fine. Like she should, I mean, she listens to me say it to mm-hmm. her all the time. Yeah. It's just, I, I would think that Arden would benefit from this podcast more than anybody because she's already primed for it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. My wife actually said something to me the other day and we were talking, like when you get older, you start talking about weird stuff and you know, she's like, if you died, I was like, uh Oh, sounds like I'm going to get murdered in my sleep, but okay, go ahead. She's like, if you died, I would go listen to the pro tips right away. And I was like, good. That was what you should do. Yeah. I was like, that would be fine. You'll do that. Mm -hmm. So if I die, if I die, I'm making air quotes. She's going to smother me with a a pillow. No, it's not a sweet idea. She's going to kill me in my sleep. Pretend I like had sleep apnea or something like that. And then (laughs) stage it perfectly. Hide all the evidence. I'm worried about saying it out loud now in case this gives her the idea. Honestly. So. (laughs) Secrets. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so do you think it's going to happen? Do you think I'm going to come to your hospital, to your practice, and speak to the practitioners? Like, honestly, 100%. The only hard part is, like, when you are, like, this to me is, like, the most exciting thing that's ever happened. But unfortunately, management, like, the higher-ups who, like, give us schedules and dates and calendars, like, to them, it's just, like, another event they have to find dates for, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense, which is unfortunate. So it just takes time, but I have no doubt that it's like, you really think it's going to happen 100%. Cool. Like not a, not a doubt in my mind. It's just the semantics of like right now, just like waiting for dates and availability and wow. stuff like that. I so. think that's great. What did I ask? How much time did I ask for? Two hours, two hours. I think that's right. Yeah. I think we talk for a good hour. I, mm-hmm. I do a high level overview like you would have seen in the video and then just answer a lot of questions, look at a lot of graphs and yeah. let people bring up scenarios and 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 answer questions. I don't see the practitioners as being any different than speaking to a person with type 1 or, or speaking to a mother of a kid who's had it for six months or something like that. Yeah, it's it's honestly the exact same thing. And I think that, if anything, it's like more valuable because for the most part, they don't live it. Like our super awesome nurse practitioner, she is type 1, which is, I mean, I shouldn't say that that's why she's so super awesome, but... Like they don't live it. And it's hard to expect someone to be able to like finesse something when they don't see it all the time. Oh yeah. But at the same time, like, honestly, I, there's this one provider and I really shouldn't say this, but she considers anything under a hundred hypoglycemia. And in the office, she gave a patient 64 grams of carbs to treat a blood sugar of 98. (laughs) I was like, I literally wanted to like, leave work i was like i can't right now i am it was like i can't believe i'm watching this right now depending on the scenario i may have made a small bolus for a 98 <laughs> and, oh my god 100 and then the the icing on top is that she in her after visit summary for this patient she puts your diabetes is not meeting your goal of xyz percent 
And it's like, okay, if they're not at like an A1C that's at goal, it's because you just treated their low to 250, their, their low in quotation marks to 250. And now that they're 250, you're going to tell them that their A1C is not at goal. I was going to say uh, 64 carbs for a 98 blood sugar makes you like 220, 250 probably. Yeah. Yeah. This patient ended up like, it was like 250 something. And I'm like cringing the entire time. I'm like, please tell me this is all just a bad dream. Do the patients notice that's wrong or do some of them go, oh, okay. So I, an unfortunate amount, don't know any better. I did have one. I think I told you about this guy. He was like, he was, I think he was like 85, newly diagnosed. I got into like, they do a CGM kind of teaching with him. I gave him my two cents of wisdom, listen to the juice box podcast. And then at his next office visit, he was in and his blood sugar was like 85. And as he's walking out the door, this provider asked me to help him treat a low. And he looks at me and he goes, I'm not doing that because I'm not low. And he credited it to the juice box podcast. And I was like, that is so wholesome. And like, there's people who do know better and who, who succeed. Granted, this kid at his next office visit got told that his average of 120 was fake because of his lows. Because um, it was 85 lows? Yes, because of which I wanted to scream, but I just have to sit beside myself on my little desk and pretend I don't hear anything. Well, doesn't that make you wonder how many other people in your situation are sitting in other offices around the world doing the same thing? I'm willing to bet that there's like a, there's just someone who feels exactly the way I do in every single endo office. It's just sometimes the, I don't want to say the power dynamics because that's not it, but sometimes you're forced into oblivion and you can try to respectfully in part what you want to say and some people are open to hearing it and some people aren't which is tough yeah so is there a lot of confirmation bias like do some sometimes when you see a provider say something that's so out of bounds does it do you see it make the patient comfortable like oh i could just leave my blood sugar at 150 great like does that happen i think i think that there's certain times where it definitely does if a patient's in the office and like is sitting and and they'll do like a random finger stick and it's like in the 100s, maybe it's like 190. They're like, oh, that's not too bad. But then when their A1C correlates to an average of 190, they get scolded for it. So it's like, I feel like there's this discordance between reality and like, like, yeah, a 190, you're not 500, but that's also not healthy. Mm -hmm. Like, so I think it's yeah. Thanks for the dual message too. One ninety is exactly. great. Exactly. Yeah. Your exactly. A1C is terrible. Like, <laughs> we want you to succeed, but hey, let's make this more hard. More more hard. Oh my god, I can't talk. More difficult than it's supposed to be. So tell me if so. if I if I gave you the power and you were able to change one thing, like what do you think would help people? Being the providers, I mean, what would help the providers? I, this is going to sound. Like cliche, because this is exactly what you said that your nurse practitioner has told you guys, but the fear of lows, because it's the lows that drive people to this insanity. Like, because providers are so afraid of people having lows, like terrified of lows. Like if we get, if we have someone call in and they're saying they're having a low blood sugar, it goes high priority in our like in basket, which is our like messaging system. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yes, lows are important, but like lows are like, lows are part of like diabetes. Like Just like you don't always get an A plus on every test. Like that's just part of how it goes. And it doesn't mean that like everything's wrong. Your basal rates are totally screwed up. Like a pattern of lows might, but one isolated low, it doesn't. And there's this just, there's this fear of lows that providers put into patients and it makes everything so much harder for everyone. Yeah. So apparently last night I was working late at night i know that you said you're boring i i was like 11 o'clock working on the podcast on sunday night and that sounds like something i would do just like homework on a yeah on a weekend yep i believe arden and kelly were watching big brother nice and uh, arden decided potato chips would be the way Mm -hmm. to go for uh, a snack while she was watching big brother and i don't think she got the timing of it right so she went up uh, 150 or 160 and then I went to bed and everyone went to bed. And a couple of hours later, she was like, you know, 50 because she just, she didn't pre bowl as well for the chips. Right. And mm-hmm. eventually the chips cleared her system and there was insulin left over and it brought her lower. And so I, you know, she tried to treat it herself with a juice and it didn't work. 
and so it just she just stayed like she she stopped what was happening but it didn't there was still enough insulin in there that it, it burned through the juice and she was so mm-hmm. now she's stable in like the mid 50s and so i got up and i'm like hey did you do anything and she's like yeah I, she's like i drank a juice and i was like all right i said she's like i'm hungry which once she's low for a little while she's gonna ask for food yeah and so i was like well i can get you a banana i don't want a banana i was like hey arden it's 3 30 in the morning <laughs> who cares what you want <laughs> just find something yeah. just eat <laughs> yeah this isn't like we're not in a restaurant right now a banana is soft it's easy and you can swish a little water in your mouth afterwards and be done with it i was like yeah. we're getting a banana so I brought a banana up and I restocked her room with juice boxes, which we don't use much anymore. So I was mm-hmm. like, you know, I brought some with me to be sure we had them. And uh, she ate the banana. I waited for like two revolutions of the CGM. And I saw a little dip before it went back to 55 again. And I was like, mm, this banana is not going to do the trick. So yeah. I said, I need you to have one more juice and then you're going to be fine. And she was like, I don't want another juice. I was like, again, it's 3 a.m. Just drink the Dang juice. I don't really care. I was like, so she drank the juice. I gave her half of it. I was like, I'll give you half and I'll wait five minutes. I mm-hmm. gave her half. I waited. And I was like, just drink the rest of it. Go to sleep. You're going to be okay. She drank it. She went to sleep. I sat in my bed for 20 minutes, made sure that we got the right outcome, which we did. And it was over. And now she's fine again. And yeah. I, I do not expect that to happen again tonight. Like it was mm-hmm. just because of the miss on the potato chips. Yeah, it's like that simple, and a provider would see that, take away go, all of her basal overnight, yep, 100%. and and then her blood sugars would start bouncing all over the place, and it would ruin weeks, if not months, of her life. And no one, no one would think to put the basal back up because the doctor said the basal was the problem. Remember, we had a problem, and the doctor said the basal was yep. too high, so that gets and, wiped from your memory now. And that exact phrase, the doctor said, is. It's imp- it's it's like impregnated in so many people's brains that like this is how it's supposed to be. And you've talked about this a million times, but it's that like it's that there's so much of and I think part of it's because like your your endo is not following your your Dexcom, like part of that, but there's so much I feel like ninety five percent of the advice you get within your endo's office is that static diabetes management. And to succeed you have to be dynamic with it. Right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even be terrible if they gave you that information and said, listen, this is kind of the basis of it. And mm-hmm. you're going to need to, you know, it's more like a dance. You're going to have to stay light on your feet here and, and bob and weave a little bit. You might have to duck a couple of punches and take your shots where you can. Like, there's more of that going on than it's not math. It, it's left with like, it's mathematical and it's so not. It, it's so true. And honestly, like there's a ridiculous amount of our patients on pumps who don't even know how to change their settings. They don't know how to manually, like whenever there's like an adjustment, like I, I, I spent like two and a half hours on the phone to this woman last week, like walking her through how to like change her settings yeah. because like they, people just don't know how to change their settings. They don't know how to like press the buttons. They don't know which, which process it is because they just don't like, I mess with my settings all the time. And like, I, like the provider I see is like in her office, but like, she's like, right on, have at it. Right. But like people, it's a scary amount of people that just don't know how to do that. I was helping someone this week and I don't think they would mind me saying this much about it, but you know, their kid having, it's classic, exactly what we've been talking about. And I, I let her message me for a little while, like to get it out of her system. And then I was like, okay, well, do you want to like, are you looking for my help? Like, you know, I can try to help you. I don't know if I'll be good at it or not. Like, keep in mind, I'm not a doctor and all that stuff. And she's like, no, I'm, I'm just like, what do you think? And I said, well, your basal profile doesn't make any sense to me. It's set up like at least four times a doctor looked at it and said, oh, are you having a low here? Take away the basal. With a thousand and one different basal rates by hour. Well, how about one of them is two units an hour and one of them's 0.3 an hour. Yeah, that just, uh, that's called like somewhat, that's, and it was probably around a meal to compensate for a carb ratio is my assumption. And I'm just like, listen, <laughs> so yeah, no, there's no, no way that two is right. And point three is right. Absolutely not. 100. Some, something's fishy here. Yeah. Well, what would you do? I said, uh, I would just shoot for the middle and start over again. Yeah. And then I did my little thing where I asked how much the kid weighed, which mm-hmm. has no real basis in medical theory. I just, completely anecdotal from all the conversations I've had. 
And I was like, all right. I said, if I'm you, let's set it at this at 24 hours. I said, you're mm-hmm. probably going to get a little low overnight. So if that happens, take some away. But the person had trouble making the decision, like, like to like take it away. And they did it finally. And, you know, okay, we go back and forth for it. I just said, look, 24 hours from now, send me another graph. You know, and I think we did it like three days in a row. And on the third day, I was like, well, what do you want to do? Thinking like, you know, she's starting to get the vibe and she had ideas to do it. And then I was like, okay, well, I said, if you were seeing a lower sugar overnight at like one, starting at one, I'm like, what if you cut the basil back at like 11 and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And, you know, she's like, well, no, I think he needs it here. So we settled on these, these like three numbers, which I was pretty cool with. Like there was a daytime, an overnight and a leading into overnight basil rate. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, well, she goes to set, set it up in the pump and she really struggled to set the basil profile up. Yeah, it's like astonishingly difficult for a lot of people because they just never like it's a lot of times it's here, hand it over to the doctor, doctor will do it. Or the phrase that I hate that I get told a lot is call the manufacturer to find out how to do it. Like, no, no one's going to do that. They're just going to sit there with the bad settings. You've heard a doctor tell a person to call a manufacturer to learn how to change their basal rates? That's what that's what like us as assistants in the office are supposed to do. We're supposed to tell the patient to call the manufacturer. So I'm like, no. So I'm like, anyone who needs to change anything, bring it to me and I will walk them through it. Cause I'm not leaving someone high and dry. Because if you told me, so I use t If you told me to call Tandem to find out how to change my basal rates, I'm not going to do it. Well, so no, I'm going to talk someone through it because I want to make sure that they do it. Not only that is like, has the, the internet's pretty popular now. Has no one heard of yeah. it there? <laughs> yeah, no, it's just like, no. There's a whole system of computers, Ava, and they're... <laughs> I know, they're and they connected. do like fancy things. Yeah, they're connected to each other. People's ideas are available. It's really crazy. It's you should check it out. hundred percent. Call the manufacturer. And meanwhile, the I manufacturer know. does not want to be involved in that. And one hundred percent, no, isn't allowed to be involved in it. Exactly, because if they make some, if they make a mistake, then it's their fault. They're not allowed to give medical advice. No one's allowed to give medical. We, we live in a in a situation where everyone who knows should be saying what they know. And instead, yeah. no one will say anything. And like, I think that's honestly what drives diabetes care to be so poor is because if, imagine if providers weren't afraid of the liability of a patient having a low, like yeah. just imagine, like, I think that would make so much difference. Like, and so I'm in school to, for nursing right now. Um, and so I'm spending a lot of time in the hospital and like, I had like a 350 pound patient on 10 units of Lantus and a sliding scale with no base dose. And I was, and I'm like, this is absurd. And it's because they're like, oh, well, we'd rather have him be high than low. And it's like, he's trying to recover from osteomyelitis. Like he's got a wicked infection in his foot. These high blood sugars aren't helping. And it's like, imagine what things would look like if we weren't afraid of the liabilities of the world we live in. You're telling me a 350 pound person using 10 units of basal insulin Yeah, a no, day? I was like, that's enough basal insulin for his toe. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> There's a strong possibility that they need I mean, 50, 60, like something like that. Yeah, it's, and a sliding scale with no base dose. So like if their blood sugar's in range at meals, they're not going to get any insulin at all. And what's in range? So a lot of the sliding scales in the hospital are like, if they're under 150, they don't get a base dose. But then you're curious why at bedtime they're like 300 and you have to correct the 300. And it's like, well, it's that exact idea. The insulin for now is insulin now is for later it's like if you just fix the later now (laughs) you're curious yeah you can't not give someone with type one insulin at a meal like i'm sorry like use your brain a little yeah you're curious is the is the most delightful thing you've said so far today like you're curious (sighs) as to why which meant that was like your like that was your sarcasm right there yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) it comes out sometimes (laughs) is there anything that we have not spoken about that we should i honestly can't think of anything is there any chance you don't want me to put this up because you think you're going to get fired i i was honestly just thinking that (laughs) (laughs) so i was just sitting here like i've said a lot of things that i probably shouldn't have said yeah i'd like you to think about this before i release this yeah i i know i was i was honestly just like staring out the window and thinking like at the very least maybe we should take your name out of this (laughs) yeah it's just honestly though it just 
I mean, if I go down like this, I go down like this. But <laughs> no, I no, 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 no. We're not. We're not doing that. Too. You're gonna. <laughs> you're gonna help far more people where you are than at home. Going. You believe I got fired over that? Because, um, <laughs> but yeah, think really think about it. And if you want to hear it first or something, like I'll send it to you so you can hear it. I'm I can take you up on that. I can totally take all your identifying markers out of. But you are going to be able to hear. And we did talk about me coming to your place, so. Mm-hmm. It won't be hard yeah. for someone to figure out if they're listening. <laughs> Listen, I enjoyed our conversation. If you and I are only the only ones to ever hear it, it's okay with me, okay? I might take you up on hearing it through first. I definitely don't want to lose my job. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, like, it just, it's the things that, like, just don't, the things that go under the rug. And it's, like, the deep, dark, and dirty of what goes on at the Ender's office. And that sounds horrible to say, but it's, like, yeah, it's like that like back closet that no one ever opens, but it's so true and you have to at one point face it. I don't know. Could this be the time I put a voice changer on somebody? Would that be great if you were like a robot? It was like wah, wah, wah. it sounds like a squirrely mouse. Like I don't know. I don't even know how to do it. If I'm being hundred percent honest with you, I I'm not certain I would be able to do it. Um okay. All right, well let's stop recording and I'll say goodbye <laughs> and give me one second. A huge thanks to a longtime sponsor, Touched by Type 1. Please check them out on Facebook, Instagram, and at touchedbytype1.org. If you're looking to support an organization that's supporting people with type 1 diabetes, check out Touched by Type 1. A huge thanks to Dexcom for being longtime sponsors of the Juicebox podcast. Dexcom.com slash juicebox. Head over there now. Get started today. I'd like to thank Cozy Earth for sponsoring this episode of the Juicebox podcast and remind you that using my offer code JUICEBOX at checkout will save you 40% off of your entire order at CozyEarth.com. That's the sheets, the towels, the clothing, anything available on the website. If you have a story to tell or you know somebody whose story would be interesting, please contact me through the website, JuiceBoxPodcast.com. I would love to tell your cold wind story. If you're looking for community around type 1 diabetes, check out the Juicebox Podcast private Facebook group, Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes. But everybody is welcome. Type 1, Type 2, gestational, loved ones, it doesn't matter to me. If you're impacted by diabetes and you're looking for support, comfort, or community, check out Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes on Facebook. And I'd like to take another second to thank Rob at Wrong Way Recording for this awesome edit. I swear I know what the original voice sounds like from this, and I don't even think the person's going to recognize themselves. It's really amazing. The episode you just heard was professionally edited by Wrong Way Recording. WrongWayRecording.com Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.